Everybody hear me okay? Good. All right. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this, uh, this conference is put on by our Energy and Environment Commission. One of the first things I was asked to do, first of all, I'm Jim Hovland, I'm your mayor. And uh, in case you're wondering, well, who's that guy standing up there? <laughs> and uh, really pleased not to be your lame duck mayor that I've got four more years to uh, serve the great people of our town uh, on all these wonderful things that we have to do, uh, including airline traffic patterns is the new thing that popped up uh, over the last few days. Uh, this uh, notion that with advancing technology, uh, we can uh, condense the flight patterns and wouldn't it be good to run them over Edina with about 130 takeoffs a day. So, uh, and that's just over one part of Edina. So we got to work on that this weekend with the uh, MAC and then we got a meeting there on Monday with the MAC board. Uh, that came out, uh, that recommendation came out of something called the uh, Noise Oversight uh, Committee uh, and we have no voice there. We didn't even know they were doing this work. And they felt no obligation to tell us over the last five years that they were doing this work. So we've got a due process uh, argument that we're raising and I think we'll raise it effectively. So stay tuned on that. Um, one of the things that I was asked to, to do was to ask folks if you were interested in uh, learning more about the Energy and Environment Commission or maybe working on a subgroup uh, that you go to uh, the city website at edinacity.gov, type in Go Green in the search box uh, or click on City Government Advisory Boards and Commissions in the menu bar and pick Energy and Environment Commission in the drop down. Everybody got that? <laughs> that seemed more complicated than I thought it was going to be. I think the the typing in go green is a better way to do it. So uh, we're going to have a real interesting night this evening. And uh, you're going to see me sneak out of here about 7.20. Uh, I've got to go cut a ribbon down at 50th in France. Uh, I can't quite figure out what the name of this store is. It's Per, per Anna. Perana, Perana. It's P-R, capital A-N-A. -A. So anyway, that's ribbon cutting at 7.30 on that one. Um, so you all know that uh, we have a terrific Energy and Environment Commission, and if you're on the Energy or Environment Commission or on a subgroup, can you raise your hand for folks? Yeah, it's just, uh, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> These folks with all of their talent uh, and their desire have been, have been moving us along, helping us get our baseline in terms of CO2 emissions, helping us uh, figure out where we can work from to reduce our carbon footprint. A and I think many of you know by now that are probably attending this evening, uh, we were the first city in the, in the state to take advantage of this, uh, it's called, the acronym is PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy Program. And on our panel tonight is Rick Murphy, who uh, led the way for Murphy Automotive on this idea of putting solar panels on the roof of their facility uh, on 70th and Cahill. And, and that is the first project in the state of its type. It got Senator Franken very interested. We've got some good photos uh, down at the store. And you're going to be on a panel tonight, I think, a little bit later, Rick. And, um, and then that was followed by uh, Salute that wanted to uh, do some more energy efficiency work with lighting and with some of their fans. And I think the, the, uh, the savings there are significant. And as you all know, we've, we've got a demonstration project with solar on the roof of City Hall. Now we're turning our attention uh, to residential, and I think uh, that's probably one of the reasons some of you are here tonight, and you're going to hear uh, some of the folks talk about that. So I'm going to uh, bring up now uh, Joel Haskard, who is the co-director of Clean Energy Resource Teams, and Joel has a presentation he's going to make tonight. Bob? You want to show the video first, and then have Joel come up? Okay, Joel. All right. Does someone know they're supposed to start the video? Do they? Okay. More valuable than ever here in Edina. That's because the city is heating up its newly installed solar panels. We're out here, uh, we're doing a rooftop solar installation for them. And Edina is more of an ideal place to benefit from solar energy than you might think. For Minnesota, uh, we have about the same output as far as a solar system like this is what they would in San Francisco. So. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't associate the sun in Minnesota, but it balances out with the long days in the summer and the short days in the winter. So why did the city of Edina end up making the move to solar energy? We uh, applied for a, our American Recovery Grant 
and uh, we were successful. So the grant was for some kind of renewable energy. Um, we chose solar uh, because wind was not as good of an option. Once you factor in the grant and other incentives through Excel in the state of Minnesota, the cost of the city is zero dollars. The city will see a return of about thirteen hundred dollars per year. And it just kind of helps with the overall building efficiencies and reduction of operational costs. And in addition to the lowered energy costs for the city, Commissioner Iyer sees other benefits from the project. A project like this would show the commitment of the community, the Edina community, uh, towards renewable energy as part of an overall you know, strategy of energy security. So as the sun shines on Edina, it will serve as a reminder of the project that Iyer sees as an example for others to follow. I think in the state of Minnesota, Edina is definitely in the forefront. I'm very pleased that it came full circle to fruition and we were actually able to implement the project. But it's a testament to the volunteerism, I guess, in the city of Edina that we could put this together, make it happen. For Edina 16, I'm Scott Denfeld. Good. Um, just one more comment before I bring Joel up. <clears throat> this morning I helped uh, kick off and give a welcome to um, uh, the Robotics Alley Conference. Uh, for 36 hours, Edina is the center of the universe for robotics. There's a uh, conference going on at the Westin. Uh, people from all over the world here. Uh, the company uh, uh, Recon Robotics is based in Edina, and uh, out of Recon Robotics was spun this Robotics Alley, which is a trade group that is growing by leaps and bounds. So uh, watch on that front, too, as we go about building this robotics cluster in, in our greater MSP area. And I'm hoping Edina becomes a hub for some of the innovation there in terms of robotics. Uh, it would be, it, it's a natural alignment for me. Uh, uh, high paying jobs, uh, highly qualified people required to have those jobs. It just seems like a natural affiliation. So, uh, you know, on some of this, I'm really pleased to see such a great crowd here tonight. Uh, some of this work is, is difficult. Uh, it's not so, uh, uh, some parts of our community are not so accepting yet, and that's one of the reasons I really like this crowd here. Uh, you know, I, I harken back at times to one of my uh, favorite bumper stickers, change is good, you go first. Um, and and that, that, that's what happens uh, in a city where people like it the way it is, and they don't want to see a change. We know change is coming. Uh, we just want to manage that change and make it a win-win situation. And I think tonight we're going to hear some really interesting things about what's going on in the world of solar. Uh, and like the world of robotics, things are changing quickly. And I think uh, pretty soon we'll be able to have some really nice residential applications for the, these products. And Joel, come on up and we look forward to hearing what you're going to have to say tonight. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Joel Haskert. I work with the Clean Energy Resource Teams, or CERTS program. I'm based out of the University of Minnesota St. Paul campus, and I'm part of Extension and the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. Usually after that long introduction, a giant cane comes and takes me off because my time is over, but uh, I'll be okay tonight. So we're here to talk about solar tonight. A couple of things that I find interesting in all this is that um, in 2002, there were 50 solar PV installations in Minnesota. Uh, Ten years later, in 2012, there's over 950. So it's a it's a booming industry. It employs a lot of people. Who are who in this room, just out of curiosity, are employed in some way? Or they're an installer, or they're a manufacturer, or they're employed in the solar industry in some way? Raise your hand. This is very intimidating for me, frankly, because these people all know a lot more about solar than I do. So if I look out to them and they're kind of shaking their heads no or giving me a thumbs down, I, I tend to get upset. But uh, anyway, I'm going to now give a brief PowerPoint, a little bit about who we are and what we do. I'm then going to have uh, Todd Fink come up from Century College and uh, finish that up. We're, we're then going to have a panel of folks from right here in Edina who have installed solar, and they can tell you about their experiences. And uh, after that, we want to make sure and folks have a time to network. Uh, we have a resource fair with a lot of good folks. This is Aaron, who saves me probably periodically throughout the night. Thank you very much. Just hit F5, F5 right? That's my magic? Yep. Okay. He saw me trembling earlier at the technical stuff, so he knows that uh, he's got some help there. So anyway, uh, 
so our mission with the clean energy resource teams, we're not an advocacy group, we're not a policy group. We simply want to work with communities around the state to um, identify and implement energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. So what we do, we host meetings like this one. Uh, we probably do about 40 to 50 meetings around the state. Uh, Diana McEwen typically does the uh, metro events. She's actually in Turkey right now. Her mother had a, had a fall there, so she's bringing her back to the US. And uh, I typically work in greater Minnesota, but tonight I'm, I'm covering for her. So Diana McEwen would be the person you would typically work with here in the metro. Um, we write tons of case studies, so when people do projects, a solar project, a geothermal project, a wind project, an energy efficiency project, we want to know what happened. So we do about a one or two page case study, we interview the person, we ask what worked, what didn't work, uh, what did you like about this, what would you do differently, and we have the person's name, email, and phone number at the bottom so you can call them up and email them and ask them yourself about their project. Um, we provide seed grants, and when I say seed grants, I mean very small, typically two or three thousand dollars for some projects. And uh, we try to help uh, uh, communities uh, advance energy efficiency and renewable energy. And I'd encourage you to go to our website, cleanenergyresourceteams.org. That's my official propaganda. Uh, one of the things that we manage is the Clean Energy Project Builder. Uh, this is a site to help you find uh, small wind, large wind, and solar installers and manufacturers. Um, it used to be that the Department of Commerce, Division of Energy Resources maintained this. They've said, good luck, you guys do it. And then I could have sworn I heard them chuckling as they handed it over to us. But right now it's been a great resource for folks, and I hope you'll take advantage of it. Uh, there are currently five major solar manufacturers in Minnesota. There's one for solar hot water, two for solar air heat, and two for solar PV. Typically, folks think of solar as solar photovoltaic, uh, creating electricity either for your home or back onto the grid, but don't forget there's also solar thermal, which could be uh, heating up the water for your home, or solar air heat, which could be heating up the air that then gets um, sort of um, piped into your home with fans. So there's a lot of different, and then there's passive solar, which is just the way your home or your greenhouse is aligned to the sun uh, to get some energy and some heat up from that way as well. Now, I don't know if you can, can everybody read this? This is pretty interesting. Diana, who I mentioned earlier, has solar uh, on her house, and so she wanted to give folks a, a, a breakdown of that project. So this is a 5.7 kilowatt system. There are 30 silicon energy, 190 watt modules. Uh, silicon energy is a solar manufacturer in Mountain Iron, Minnesota, up on the Iron Range. Uh, talks about the inverter. And so then she talked about the cost, which I think a lot of people, when they come to these things, they're curious about what do these things cost anyway? So the total installed cost when she did this in 2012 was $48,000. There's a 30% federal tax credit, so that knocked off $14,000. Xcel Energy has a very generous solar rewards program, which knocked off an additional $12,000. And then Xcel Energy also has a made in, Minnesota, made in Minnesota program, which knocked off $15,000. So a $48,000 project was knocked down to about $5,000. Now that has changed some. Uh, the Solar Rewards uh, program has, um, the, 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 the benefit that you're giving has been reduced some. The, the, the bad news, I guess, is that it's been reduced some. The good news is maybe more people will be able to take advantage of it. So she went ahead and broke down the numbers then for 2013 if you would do it next year. And you can see it's, it's still, I think, if you put all those incentives together, if you bundle those incentives, it's a, it's a pretty good deal. Very good. Yep. These these costs are for this is all in. So uh, so I, I do not have that breakdown. That's a good point. So in a little bit, I think. Well, a little bit. When I say a little bit, I, I guess I mean now. I'm going to bring uh, Todd Fink up from uh, Century College, and he's going to finish up the presentation. Then we're going to bring some folks uh, from here in Edina who have done um, some. Uh, have done some installs themselves, and then we'll have plenty of time to network and go out to the resource fair. So without further ado, Todd, I'll give it to you. Now remember, if you don't stand right here, the cameras start, exactly. <laughs> no, the cameras will follow me. Yeah, Story of my life. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joel. Um, I apologize for my attire. I was, uh, I was doing some service work today, and the traffic situation made it hard for me to do the cleaning up I'd want to. Uh, my name's Todd Fink. I work at Century College as, a, as an instructor. I, I teach in a program that uh, trains people for the solar industry, um, both on the installation side and, the, uh, and on the sales side. I also work for an installer, and I also am starting a business as an installer, but today I will be speaking strictly as a nonprofit entity I, um, I, I 
I would like to give you the the truth about solar and and not the sales pitch about solar. Um, the when we work with students, when we work with site assessors, I think the uh, the the you know the first first thing to look at is you know what what is our real, really our motivation to do solar and why do we care about it? Um, generally, generally, energy costs are rising on the um, on the electric side. Excel has asked the PUC for an 11% rate increase this year, uh, which isn't an unusual thing for them to do. So energy, well, it, it, at least on the electric side, is going up in, in cost. Uh, natural gas, on the other hand, has been going down in cost for the last several years. So um, when we look at a, a motivation to do solar, replacing electricity looks like a better investment at this point than replacing natural gas but that that could change in the future but but the cost of the fuel is an important thing for people to uh, to uh, to start you know to, to start saving um, another motivation that customers generally have is uh, national security um, instability in in energy um, supply and um, you know I, I think that uh, the uh, one of the reasons that I went into uh, uh, putting a system, a solar water system, on, on my house, and and also a uh, solar electric system on my house, is that I I do think that uh, uh, there are a lot of positive economic benefits from from taking that money that I would have otherwise spent on power and power from sources that are outside Minnesota and sometimes out outside of the country, um, and keeping that money back in in you know in the Twin Cities economy. Um, but I think a main motivation that, that we kind of ignore, and especially in this presidential um, campaign where both candidates were talking about um, increasing production instead of decreasing use, the, the main thing about most of our energy sources is they're going to run out. And uh, since they're going to run out, um, there's a lot of debate over when they're going to run out. Um, coal probably won't run out for a couple of hundred years. Natural gas, which is extremely cheap right now, is probably going to last us a hundred years. Then what? You know, how how long do we want to stretch this stuff out as opposed to how quickly we want to drill or mine that stuff or frack it and pull it out of the ground and depress the energy market so that we can have a short-term run? Yeah. Uh, the, our big point right now is I feel as a community or the state of Minnesota, we really have a, a chance for a, a large impact on eliminating power plants. Big Stone 2 in, in the Dakotas was canceled for right now. Prairie Island down south, they just canceled the expansion of the nuclear power because uh, decreasing power demand, mm -hmm. too, so they couldn't justify new power plants. And I'll, I'll talk about my own family's thing in, in just a second, but absolutely right. I mean, you can play energy offense by building new plants, or you can play energy defense by doing renewable energy and, and on the conservation side. And they, you know, they both accomplish the same thing, but one of them does it in a less expensive and better for the environment way. Um, the last bullet I won't get into much because it's a point of argument that I don't even think is necessary in the whole, in the whole rationale for doing solar. Um, climate change is, according to climatologists, happening, and a uh, big reason for that is the carbon we put into the air through the uh, coal, natural gas, petroleum that we use. Um, but let's not go there. I just went there. Wait a minute. Um, I like to I like to um, to go with my students through home energy use in a big way, and I I like to. Uh, I like to show pie, pie charts because, you know, it makes us hungry and gets us ready for break. Um, this is a pie chart that has to do with typical home energy use. And this is, uh, the source on this one is the EIA or federal agency. So it's a national pie chart. We have a big piece of pie. And I had a boss who used to say, eat the big toad first. Well, you know, if you, if you start nibbling away at that big piece of pie, you're going to see a lot more difference than if you eat a small toad. Um, the big piece of pie right there is space heating and cooling. Uh, it's the largest portion of your energy use, more than likely. And um, the things that you do to reduce your home energy demand for heating and cooling, that's another big piece of the pie, those are the places where you're going to see the biggest return. 
So the first things you do are probably not calling a solar installer, which, you know, in Diana's case cost $48,000 and, and she got it down to 5000 but then realistically she has $14,000 worth of income from XL Energy that she has to pay taxes on. So it's a little more than that. I mean, we can split hairs on that. But the, but the easiest thing to do is to save energy. And the easiest way to do that is with space heating and space cooling. And the easiest way to start that is with an energy audit. Someone comes to your house, takes some measurements, and gives you the best path to save money now, to save energy, to save the environment now. All of these things have the same results. They reduce our, our reliance on, on outside of Minnesota and outside of the US fuel. They put less carbon in the air and they quit, they, they slow down, they calm the use of something that's gonna run out. Um, this from the Minnesota, the Midwest Renewable Energy Association, a dollar invested in energy efficiency saves three to five, three to eight, three to five, I've seen both of those numbers, saves three to five or eight dollars in the cost of a renewable energy system. So if you use less, you can put a machine on your house that makes less, and that'll be a smaller machine that costs less. I love the Green Pyramid. This is put out by Minnesota Power, uh, the Duluth utility. And you know there are different ways you can look at it. Uh, are there different stepping stones you take through this? First one, the smartest one, the most cost effective first, and then keep on moving down the path? Or do you keep on moving up the green pyramid? Now in this green pyramid, I can't walk over there or here, just stay right here. Look at one of the two green pyramids. Um, stare at the green pyramid. Um, the stuff at the bottom of the green pyramid is the best stuff to do first. Stuff like uh, get an energy audit, find out more about your own home energy, read your bill, um, read your bill, do something, and then look at your bill next month, next year. You've got these things on your bill that are great. It's uh, how many kilowatt hours, electricity, how many therms, natural gas, did you use this month? How many did you use last year this month? Compare them to your previous bills. Get so that when that thing comes in the mail, you're excited about opening it instead of feeling that pit of dread in your belly. Um, I, I think that that's, that's the most empowering thing is to get to get some consciousness, get, to get some awareness about what you're using. Because if you're, an, if you're an aware consumer, you end up making steps and making good choices. Uh, working up the pyramid, things like changing light bulbs. That's a pretty easy step. It's very inexpensive now, much less so than 10 years ago. Um, things like uh, insulation, air sealing, all of the things on the bottom you should do if you want to build a firm foundation for the steps at the top. Uh, solar photovoltaic, wind power, solar thermal. I think it's an interesting thing to look at the second to the last, the second from the top. Windows, replacing windows. Um, Jimmy Sparks, who works with the Neighborhood Energy Connection, says, um, there are a lot of good reasons to change windows, but energy efficiency is usually not one of them. Most of the time, that's a bad investment, almost as bad as solar photovoltaic. Well, I, I would say that soda, solar photovoltaic with the cost decreases and the rebates has probably moved down that pyramid a little bit. But we've got, we got easy stuff. And don't be like me. Don't do the hard stuff first and then have that motivate you to do the easy stuff. Um, just Google search green energy pyramid and you can you can see this thing and it's a an excellent set of set of stepping stones that'll take you um, through it the right way um, step one is to rein in your energy use this is a student of mine doing a blower door test on a house we ended up putting solar thermal on um, normally houses let about 2,000 cubic feet per minute at negative 50 pascals come through them um, the lower that number, the more airtight your house is. The more airtight your house is, the less air comes streaming in the bottom and blowing out the top, taking your fossil fuel generated heat out with your money. Um, 
get into looking at your energy bills for 12 months. The uh, XL Energy will give you that stuff and any good solar installer will ask for, for 12 months of energy bills. Um, check trends, figure out how much you're using, start the job of conserving before you put solar in your house, and, uh, and then buy a smaller solar system. Um, the utility, XL, will give you a $30 in-home energy audit, which is the best deal in energy savings. Um, I won't read all the stuff on there. Um, when I have students take energy use, both kilowatt hours on the top and therms on the bottom, and start investigating them, you see some trends. Um, the big peak in the middle that looks like the Matterhorn, that's in the summer months. Why are we using so much more in the summer? Yep, uh, air conditioning is a huge use and, and you see it in your bill. It doubles a lot of people's energy use. Then the little peak afterwards, the, the sharp little peak, is right before the holidays. Uh, probably holiday lighting, could be. Could be some other things like extra visiting by relatives, Thanksgiving going into uh, the other holidays. Pardon? More pies. Many pies, but the heat from those pies contribute to the heating of your house, so that, that's actually beneficial. What I look for when I look for these things is I look for peaks in January and February, the, 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 the teeth of the heating season. If you're using a lot of electricity in that period of time, it's probably because somebody's heating uh, with electricity. And heating with electricity, heating your home with electricity is like pouring bottled water on your lawn. It's taking something that's expensive and precious and it's degrading it into something pretty basic. It costs three times more to heat with electricity, so whenever you turn on those space heaters because you've got a cool portion of your house, um, that costs you three times more than if your, if your furnace worked right, I guess. If you spend a couple of dollars or a couple dozen dollars maybe on, on spray foam and, and caulk and you identify the right places where that cold air is getting in, making that spot uncomfortable, you fix it once forever. Running a 1500 watt space heater for 24 hours costs almost $5. So, you know, a, a patching the dike is better than bailing the water. These things are re very informative. Um, it was mentioned in the in the video that um, that we get as much um, as much sun as sunny San Francisco. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got we got an excellent solar resource here. Uh, as you can see, the area in kind of the weird uh, blue green that Minnesota's in. It's, a, it's an area that a lot of the area of the United States shares, and we got great sun. I put in a solar system on my house just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm starting to get the data back from that. And November and December are really cloudy around here. They're a depressing time to start you know, obsessing on your power output from a solar system. But I've still put in about, as much, uh, about half as much electricity as my family's used over the last few weeks. And, and most of those have been pretty cloudy days. Uh, solar works extremely well in the cold. When uh, the electrical resistance in the PN junction goes up, the electrons go across it with a higher voltage and give you more power. Um, anyway, one thing about solar installation that I will warn you against is a lot of houses in the newer parts of the city have shallower roofs if you can safely climb on the roof and you wouldn't feel like you're going to fall off, it might not be uh, tilted. A, a solar system on that kind of roof might, might not be tilted enough to shed snow off reliably in the winter. Winter isn't the best time for sun in Minnesota, but losing all of it hurts. And um, back when I started installing solar in 2006, we tilted systems all the time. Now there's kind of an aesthetic hit you take because you got something that's not at roof angle that's sticky, sticking up and, and you know, might, might be considered an eyesore. But uh, to me, it's an eyesore seeing solar covered by snow all winter long. Yes, sir? Okay. Uh, and I can, I, can, I can do that. Thank you. Um, solar comes in three different flavors. Uh, the one in the center peeking behind the other photograph is a photovoltaic solar electric system. There's solar water heat to the right, 
and there's solar air heat to the left. Um, one of my turnoffs is seeing solar air heat or any other kind of solar in the shade. And that is one of the issues with solar air heat is it's hard to find a really nice sunny location on a vertical wall down low in Minnesota, in town. But there are places where it works really well. Okay, solar Plinko. If you put you as a customer in the top of this thing, where do you get sorted out? Solar water heating might be a good option if natural gas costs anything. <laughs> or if, if you heat water with electricity, solar water heating is an excellent option. It's more efficient than the other types of solar um, at getting energy out of, the, out of the sun. It can be accomplished on a smaller budget. It, can, it is a smaller system if you have a smaller area to put solar on. And, um, and steeper roofs really favor it very well. Solar photovoltaic. You really should be looking for a very, very, very sunny area. Uh, if, you, if we have a discussion about uh, what's more important, the tree or the solar, and you side with the tree, then you really should probably give up on that solar. Um, solar photovoltaics are very shade sensitive, and even when we use what are called microinverters to break up the array so that shade on one area doesn't affect the other area, it's still shade, and it still affects your investment, and solar should be in sunny spots. Solar air heat, you can do that on the, uh, I should say that uh, solar photo photovoltaic doesn't necessarily need larger areas. You can do a small system like I did with a smaller budget, uh, but then you're going to be hitting a little bit less of your use. Solar air heat can be done on the smallest budget, but you need a good sunny location in the winter, low on the house. What do we have for incentives? Or, well, let's talk, just call these fun facts because incentives doesn't sound, stimulus sounds fun, but incentives don't sound very fun. Um, solar is connected to the grid, the utility grid, so when you're not at home using it during the day, the electricity, the electricity gets exported and you get credit for that. Then at night when you need it, you buy it back. Um, grid connection makes solar feasible. Grid connection didn't exist before 2005 in a lot of areas. Um, the cost of solar photovoltaics went down. I was pricing a system out today and it's pretty easy to get solar photovoltaic modules at somewhere approaching a dollar a watt. And when I started in the business in 2006, it was six dollars a watt. Um, that's a difference. The other stuff costs about the same, the other parts of the materials. Incentives cover about 50% for most of us. If you're a business, incentives can, cost, can cover way more than that because you have extra tax advantages. Uh, solar hot water, I'll just zip through these fast. Uh, solar water is a fairly, or water is a big uh, piece of your energy pie in most households. Solar water can do a lot of good. Solar water also replaces something that's fairly inexpensive. So Nietzsche said, God is dead. Solar water is kind of dead, actually. Um, solar air heat, that's what it looks like. It needs a vertical wall, but it works pretty well. Incentives, there is something called a Forms 5695. I filled one out in 2007, and I'll fill one out again this year. Um, it will allow me at whatever my taxation rate or, no, it will be a credit, and it doesn't, it's not a deduction. So it doesn't matter on my taxation rate like some things. You get 30% of your investment back through federal taxes. It rolls over. XL Solar Rewards, I got 225 this year. It's, two, it's $1.50 a watt this year, but the cost of the equipment has come down enough so that the rebate's not as important. I'm glad that they reduced it. Uh, there's something called a Minnesota Made Bonus. It supports the type of modules that are on this roof um, and another kind of module that are made right here in Minnesota. $2.75 a watt. Tax exempt on equi equipment if you're a business accelerated depreciation. And Edina is the first place in Minnesota to do PACE financing, which, which turns the cost of the solar into a tax assessment on you so there's no money down just a, uh, a higher tax assessment. That's me. Yeah, that's a good point. Not necessarily. 
they're working on it, but there's, yeah. Well, it's not available to resident, residential customers now. <laughs> now, anyway. Yes, sir. Sure. Well, the smart grid is many pe many things to many people. Um, one one Minnesota product I'd like to talk about is silent power inverters. They're an inverter that has four batteries in it. Most of the solar we're talking about, most of the solar we're talking about isn't battery based at all. It goes directly to the utility grid. Excel is a great battery, but what silent power offers is storage, solar storage. Now what that could do for Excel that would be beneficial is in the middle of the summer when everybody's got their AC cranked and they have their highest demand, they have to build their whole system to support that highest demand or else we have brownouts and blackouts like they did in the Enron, California. Now one component of the smart grid might be storage that dumps on the grid during those peak, peak times and essentially lowers the peak for everybody. Electric cars will have batteries that are hooked to the grid, and there might be contracts that Excel has with electric car owners that have them buy battery storage during the day when they have peak demand so that they can bring down the rest of their infrastructure. Um, that's one component, but there's a lot of stuff with smart grid. As a follow-up, you want me to use the microphone? Yes, please. <laughs> Just subtle hand as he runs over towards you. Okay, I'll talk louder now, come on. <laughs> uh, I, I've also read and heard that one of the greatest wastes of electricity are the actual wires, the transmission cables, the uninsulated wires that stream from the pole to the house or the big transmission towers. Isn't that something that the utility company should be looking at? I think some of it's unavoidable, and, and, but I will say this, that uh, the biggest loss of energy in Excel's uh, whole chain of possession here is heat loss at the power plant. That accounts for about 60% of the energy. The coal that they burn never turns the turbines to make the electricity. About 7% is lost in transmission. So that leaves about a third of it that you actually get delivered. Actually, we'll do one more, and then we'll, uh, we'll have to keep moving. But we'll, at the resource fair, we'll have plenty of time to ask. Yeah, I'm not questions. leaving, so we can talk later. I have some show and tell if anyone's interested for your bottom of the green pyramid. Available from any library in the area is what they call a power check meter for free. You can check it out for three weeks. You plug your gadgets into it and it documents how much power it uses. And I only well, just picked it up on the way over here. And you can plug it in your computer and see how you're using your electricity. I have this stinking theory that about a third of my electric bill is coming from my ratty old fridge. So if I were to be installing solar power, it'd be far cheaper for me to you know, find out if that was true and get a better fridge. And I will piggyback on that and say that at most of the big box home retailers um, that I don't have to advertise for, you can buy something called a kilowatt meter It'll cost about $20. You plug it into the wall, you plug the ratty fridge into that, and you get an idea of how many kilowatt hours a day that uses. And you can do a lot of sleuthing to reduce energy use. My family was able to cut our energy use in half over the last four years. So that's about a, that's a, you know, that with the gas savings, that, yeah, and a kilowatt meter is even, even simpler, it's smaller, plugs right into the wall, but that does too. It's just a kilowatt, a kilowatt meter with a plug on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, at $100 a month we save in energy costs now because we've, we've done a lot of the green pyramid stuff. And you can buy a lot of solar for that. <laughs> thank you. Todd, thank you very much. We're gonna go ahead and get started with our solar owner panel. We're gonna uh, start with Rick Murphy here with uh, Grandview Tire and Auto. And I think you're all set to go. Your clicker is there. Also, do we have, uh, is uh, Chuck here? Hi there, Chuck, you'll be next. <laughs> okay, I can give you this as well. Thanks, Brian. Hello everybody, I'm Rick Murphy from Grandview Tire and Auto. Uh, I believe we've got the home of, I think, the largest uh, solar system in the city here so far. Uh, we are the first also to be take part of the uh, PACE financing program. Our project essentially took 
like uh, almost a six six months or so from beginning to end, from all the uh, the design you know, to the concept to the construction to when we actually turned it on. Uh, process took so long, mostly because of the pace assistance and everything that we helped uh, get integrated into the city of Edina. Uh, I got a whole series of pictures here for you as to our system. I'll describe some of them uh, as we go through. If you have any questions, feel free to you know, stop me and wave your wave your hand. Uh, our system consists of 117 solar panels total. Uh, you know, conservatively speaking, we should, we, uh, I hope, because we haven't been, had it installed for an entire year yet, that it will be about $3,000 in electricity that we'll save. Uh, that is for our business. Uh, we have nine, nine service bays. Uh, we have a car, car wash with blowers on it. We <coughs> consume a lot of electricity on site. Even $3,000 a year, it consumes the solar panel system, or the solar system provides us about a third of our energy usage. So everything we can do on site to you know, be more efficient and you know, makes, makes us a, a better facility, makes us feel better about what we do. Uh, this is the facility itself with the solar panels installed on it. I just took this the other day. Uh, you can slightly see some of the panels across the top of the building right there, but for the most part, it doesn't really affect the uh, the, the overall aesthetics of the facility or the building. Uh, this is a picture from, from Google here that uh, does not have the, uh, any of the solar installed here quite yet, but overall the, the majority of the building is covered with the solar panels today. Uh, it was an ideal application in our situation just because we, uh, the building is new as of uh, three, uh, rough, um, you know, close to four years ago now. Uh, upon, you know, construction of the facility, we've did a lot, you know, to help conserve energy, both you know, heat, heating, air conditioning, installed this white PVC roof uh, on the building that helps us, you know, conserve energy in the summer months. You know, re reducing the air conditioning expenses of the, of the property uh, keeps the building cool, cooler. Uh, during the winter, the white roof also uh, helps retain the snow on the roof, so it helps keep the warm air inside. Somewhat of an igloo effect. So, uh, the the during last you know, PVC roof is also an ideal application for solar on top of it also, so everything worked out great. Uh, that's, a, that's a rendering of what the roof looks like with all the solar panels on top of it there. Uh, the main components that we had in our system, you know, obviously that we used uh, Trina solar panels. They seem to be one of the most efficient panels out there uh, for our application. Uh, we added the, the three different uh, 10 kilowatt uh, transformers. Uh, and then we have a Tigo energy, energy maximizer system, which I'll go into a little more detail with a few of the slides that I have ahead. But overall, our system is uh, almost 27 kilowatts total. That's, this is the roof uh, before the installation. Uh, nice, flat, even application. Uh, being the roof wasn't originally intended to have solar on top of it, I didn't want any penetration through the new rooftop, so we actually put a uh, ballast system for all the solar panels. Uh, there'll be some pictures here also. This is the racking system that was installed. It's got a rubber feet across the whole base of it. Uh, there's cradles that go over the top of those feet below that ha you know, hold cinder blocks to hold the whole system down to make sure it don't go anywhere as the, as the temperatures uh, and as, as the winds pick up. This is upon when they started uh, going through the installation process. There's all the panels completely installed on the roof there. You can kind of see roughly on the, on the lower right-hand side there some of the ballast blocks that help you know, hold, hold the panels down to the roof, too. There's a better picture of that. Some diff different angles. You can kind of see you know, the pitch of the roof. You know, the roof's actually a rather shallow roof, so there's only about a, a two-foot you know, edging on the side of the building, so they stay pretty low. Correct. How much weight do you have? Uh, I guess we, we did do a uh, uh, ballast means extra weight, and what is the total amount of weight, extra weight you have? Uh, we had engineers do the analysis on it. I guess I can't be certain. You know, the because of the design of the roof, that PVC ballast system, or the, the PV, white PVC roof does not require any rock to hold it down like typical rubber systems do. So we had this, the weight savings on the building in the first place. 
the roof was engineered and designed for a typical ballasted system. So, you know, you, in our situation, we had to obviously have the, you know, structural engineers go through and make sure that, you know, the roof was going to handle the capacity of both snow weight, you know, rain weight, you know, and the solar panels. Well, each of the panels are covered with a, uh, I believe that's a uh, tempered glass. It's a solar glass, I think, is how they define it, actually. So as to their actual durability, I, you know, I can't really say. Perfect guy to answer that. What happens in a uh, photovoltaic installation is that you have different types of panels. And to answer your question, typically a normal panel in the standard uh, industry standard is a 1.1 diameter piece of hail at 60 miles an hour can hit your photovoltaic or glass roof system and not break it. Anything over that, then it's an insurance issue. Thank you, Brad. Uh, those are the three inverters we have on the wall, uh, along with the, all the electrics, uh, electrical connections and circuit breakers and everything on the uh, that's inside of our building. Uh, that you know, size-wise is about the size of a four by eight sheet of plywood, so it doesn't consume a lot of space. We got it on a second level, you know, close to the ceiling in the building, so it was uh, some useless wall space at the time, anyways. Uh, Part of the TIGO system, this is what really, you know, I believe makes this system, you know, you know proves that it proves its worth essentially. We can track it, monitor it. Uh, every month I get these reports by email from, from TIGO that says exactly what the output is of our system. Uh, you know, some, some of the numbers, if you can't see them or see them, uh, we got, you know, since, we, since this, the inception of it back in May, uh, you can see the graph. Uh, as far as its first growth on the lower left-hand side there. Uh, some of the peak months that we had throughout the course of summer here so far. Uh, almost 4,500 4, uh, kilowatts in July, it looks like was our you know, most fruitful month as far as energy with the most sun. Uh, we also get a you know, bar graph throughout the days of the month. This is just October's in the upper right-hand corner there as to which days produce the amount of mo most amount of electricity. Uh, and then I believe on the, the hour production meter is on the lower right as far as what hours of the day we're producing the most amount of electricity. Uh, logging into the web to the website, which is accessible anywhere at any point in time, you know, for me to go in to see exactly what the results were. Some comparisons being made on this. Uh, the, you know. The amount of energy that our systems produced here so far is the equivalent of removing 72 vehicles from the road. Uh, estimated uh, 310 trees being planted. Uh, total amount of energy that it's produced so far is 18 megawatts in the up, upper left-hand corner. Uh, when I first log into the system, this is the screen that it shows me. It show, this is the layout of the grid. You know, it resembles the layout uh, on the roof of the building. So this, show, this is showing me early the, on, mon on Monday that each of the panels are roughly you know, about 34 to 44 watts. It actually shows a number on each of the different panels. So I know if any of them are shaded, if any of them you know, are, are, are not producing uh, the energy that they should be, I can uh, monitor it and make adjustments as necessary. This is what it looks like as the uh, energy produce production goes up. This is roughly about 220 watts per panel. As they're getting produced, I can also divide it up and show it based on the inverter, which inverters are producing the most. All the panels are divided amongst each inverter equally. Uh, grid from the first month we got it installed in May uh, until today, the brighter the green, the more energy was were produced on those days. So can actually look back and see how, how sunny of a month it was in, in the end. Good weather, good weather results. And you see that's why July, you know, was one of the, one of the highest producing months. And uh, this, these graphs also show me, show me quite a bit uh, in regard to its production. This is on a month basis, which days of the month produced how much electricity. So a lot of historical data to support, you know, 
its its worth and its value, and uh, it makes it easier for us to kind of project what uh, what what we'll get from the system overall. Questions for Rick? Live. You haven't lived through winter yet, but the incident angle doesn't look too steep. You're going to have to shovel them, or do they just melt off? What's, uh... As I was told, because they're glass and because they're dark also, these solar panels, at least throughout the course of the month, they're almost too hot to put your hand on them. They, they produce a lot of heat, and uh, from my understanding is that it also happens throughout the course of the winter too. So very, you know, most, snows, most of the snow will just melt right off of it, drip below it. Under substantial heavy stoves, you might have to take a you know, brush to them or something. Well, time will tell. You bet. You know, as a solar installer, you know, I have no real interest in this. We've already uh, installed a system on Rick's place. But historical da data uh, shows that in Minnesota, because of the low azimuth or the low projection of the, the, the sun's light, the reason we angled the uh, array lower was because uh, between November 15th and February uh, 28th or whatever, uh, it's only 5 to 7 percent of the total use of the energy production. So I get this question all the time, oh, Bradley, what about uh, shoveling? Well, it's only 5 percent. So if you, if you don't worry about shoveling, and that's in Rick's case, that's what we had to convince uh, his dad, Tim, over there, uh, of is that all right? We'll angle them down. So, what we're concerned with is the total amount of the angle or the the annual production in the sun's production years, the uh, or months. The uh, the way the sun is situated in Minnesota, it's it's insignificant, uh, uh, or at best, uh, a little bit less than everybody thinks. Rick, thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is Chuck. There you are. <laughs> Microphone here. Flicker there. Yeah, you got where to progress? This yeah, pants. That does it. Got okay. Five or seven minutes or something. Good. My name is Chuck Prentice. Uh, my wife and I own a home on West 60th Street, just uh, near the Benton Bridge across Highway 100. And uh, in the spring of this year, we put a solar array on our house, and we also bought a Nissan Leaf. Um, so um, I'll focus in a few slides here mainly on the solar array, um, but then uh, say a few words about uh, its relationship to the car also. Um, am I coming through okay on the volume? Okay, all right. So um, we'd thought about doing this uh, a year earlier, um, and uh, we dawdled and missed the opportunity for sign up for the uh, solar rewards program um, in 2011. Um, and then uh, come early 2012, it looked like we were going to miss uh, it, the solar rewards program uh, with Excel was going to be fully subscribed uh, very soon again. And we we're going to miss it again. And there were these rumors out there that you know maybe the solar rewards program was going to get cut back or uh, you know discontinued or whatever. Um, so um, I, I, we rushed and uh, got in under the deadline. Uh, with the result that uh, we, we then uh, talked with our installer about uh, our 1954 construction Rambler uh, and the several additions that have been put onto it that wind up with little sections of roof jutting out this way and that way. Um, and uh, also our plan to go ahead and buy a Nissan LEAF um, and uh, how with that we thought we'd like to get uh, as big a uh, uh, solar array as we could um, to both cover our household needs and to be able to, by and large, as much as possible, uh, power the car directly from the sun also. Um, so we wound up getting a, a um, system with 33 panels. Um, 8.24 kilowatt array size. Total cost of that system was $43,000. Uh, 
Um, the Solar Rewards Program from Excel um, cut us a check that we received not too long after our, uh, const our installation was done uh, for 18,000 some. Uh, and then uh, come when I get around to filing taxes, uh, I'll have to familiarize myself with that form uh, that you mentioned um, to get the federal tra tax credit, which is expected to be around 13,000. So our net cost for our solar system is approximately $11,700. Um, I don't have a slide about this, uh, but the mm, projection uh, that we saw from our solar installer was that our payback period on this is approximately seven to eight years. Um, so um, over these next seven years or so, um, we will be saving on our energy bills, um, add up those savings, and out uh, seven or eight years from now, this is absent considerations of the car, um, just uh, you know, thinking as if we had the um, solar array system uh, for our house and household usages uh, alone. Um, after seven or eight years, um, all the savings that we will experience of uh, uh, producing a, our own uh, electricity um, and on the other besides that selling the extra whatever extra we don't use ourselves uh, back to Excel for you all or others to use um, will uh, after the seven or eight year pandemic period it'll be gravy um, we'll have um, free electricity or we'll be selling electricity uh, uh, you know getting money back so um, this, uh, I guess, is too small, probably too small for you to see. Um, but uh, this is our uh, bills from Excel uh, from March or April uh, through to the most recent one that we've received. Um, and if you look at the um, right-hand column on there is how much uh, our Excel bill per day uh, this is one of those stats that was mentioned that is on your electric bill that you can look at. Um, you see your uh, electric uh, bill per day, uh, current year, and what it was a year ago. And in the far right column, you can see that our bills per day um, in 2011 were pretty flat, which is, uh, uh, I think, the background factor to that is that we almost never use air conditioning. Um, we have one. I had argued against even getting whole house air conditioning back when we did get it. Um, uh, but now having it, um, we almost never use it, and that results in us having a pretty flat um, old experience on our electricity uh, cost and usage per day, um, you know, summer or non-summer. Um, with that, then, if you move over to the column um, second from the right, uh, in there, uh, you can see that in the March-April billing period, we had this sil similar kind of $2 and some cents uh, cost per month uh, for our electricity, uh, per day rather, um, a, comparable to the prior year. Um, but then uh, our system got, our, our solar system got turned on on May 4th, uh, and we didn't have the car yet at that point. So uh, during that billing period of uh, May, a, a late April to uh, late May, um, with the solar system starting to produce from about the middle point of the period, um, on average, our Excel bill per day during that period was 25 cents, or one-tenth of what it had been um, in the prior year. Okay. Um, in uh, the yellow highlight there is uh, the effect, uh, uh, the period when the car arrived. Um, in that period, actually, uh, so then we had the first two or three weeks of that period, we're um, producing our own electricity and not charging the car. Um, and uh, that, and, and, and the last week or so of that, we had the car, and that resulted in us getting, uh, during that period, a 58, is it 88 cents uh, per day uh, credit from Excel on that, f that first bill during our period of having our solars on our roof, um, Excel paid us. Um, 
and uh, it flows forward from there. Uh, you know, we have some months in which we have a small uh, net bill, uh, some months in which we have a small net credit. Um, um, we try to plug the car in uh, as much as possible uh, when the sun is shining. Um, uh, but you know the whole system is integrated uh, with the grid, and so we can we do have electricity at night, and we can charge the car when necessary at night. Um, these graphics here are a uh, from our system monitoring, uh, which is similar to the Tigo system uh, that was mentioned. Uh, our system monitoring system is uh, call, called Enphase. Um, it shows on here that. Um, we've produced in the first six months, roughly, of us having our system, uh, enough energy to power 177 houses uh, for a day, um, which means, roughly speaking, you know, it's been over, that's 180 days. So we've covered our own house. Um, but actually, that house up there must be a house that uses a good bit more electricity than we do because we're also powering our car. Um, you know, over that same period of time, uh, and they don't show that, uh, that their model up there is powering a car. Um, we've uh, uh, done, produced an equivalent amount of uh, um, uh, carbon uh, footprint reduction less than Grandview Tire and Auto. Uh, 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 we're at, uh, what is it, 95 trees uh, so far uh, equivalent uh, for the fact that we have our system. Um, this is uh, one other, uh, one, a graph that we have that shows our energy production uh, per day um, where, you know, the, 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 the mountain peaks are the sunny days and the uh, valleys or troughs are the really cl cloudy days. Um, we produce, uh, you know, some electricity uh, even on a very cloudy day. Um, but you can look back and check the weather uh, on our uh, electricity uh, system monitoring. Um, and, um, you know, this is the uh, Nissan LEAF. Um, it uh, is all electric, as you may know. It is not a hybrid. It doesn't have a gas uh, alternative. Um, and so th my wife does have some range anxiety. Um, uh, you know, she, she, I'll push it closer to the limits uh, than she will, and she'll get real mad at me for pushing it to the limits um, because they say that the, the more you push it to the limits, uh, there, there is some cost on the battery, um, life, battery life expectancy. I don't know to what extent that's real. Um, if I, you know, need to keep pushing it in order to get home, uh, even if I'm taking it down to two miles uh, um, remaining um, mileage uh, expectancy, I'm going to get home. I'm not going to get out and push it. Um, but it, it's about 100 miles, um, 80 to 100 miles, depending on your driving patterns and, um, and, and so on. So, uh, well, we have with the car a um, 220 volt uh, charger in the garage. And on that, the charge time is two or three hours. Um, uh, on a, if you left it, you were charging off of the regular household 110 volt, uh, that's about seven or eight hours. So you do it. Does it stop? It, it, it has the same kind of accelerator and brake pedals as other cars. Oh. Um, well, yeah, it depends on peripherals that you may have on. Um, but it's not using power energy, it's not draining the battery at that point for power. So, um, and I guess that's the end of my presentation. So. Questions for Chuck? Leon, test. I wanted to thank Chuck and Rick for your leadership within the community. And um, I think Chuck's opening remarks about the Excel rebates, and I don't think there's any Excel representatives here to talk about the solar rewards. Okay, um, the Excel rebates, uh, as many of you know, are very competitive. Um, there is going to be the solar rewards, uh, which will be relaunched in 2013, which is $1.50 per watt. Um, there's a $5 million pool of money for that. Uh, in June of 2013, there will be another $5 million pool of money, and that will be for the Minnesota-made bonus rebate. Now, 
from what we're hearing inside from Excel is that they may start taking applications as early as January for the uh, Minnesota made bonus. Um, be aware that when that cycle opened up in 2012, that $5 million pool of money was gone in about two weeks. So it's gonna go very, very quickly. There's also, as residents, you're in competition with a lot of commercial systems that are out there. And as the commercial systems come on scale, they're coming on scale at 40,000 kilowatts per system. Um, so the point in all of this is to encourage you guys, as we get through the rest of November, we get through the rest of December, if you know this is the track you're on to really take consideration and to really take advantage as January 1st comes around, um, to really think hard about the value of those rebates, what they mean to you, and what the savings are gonna bring to you. So, but thank you guys again for your leadership. Thanks again, Chuck. And also, hey, nice article in the paper today. <laughs> nice two articles in the paper today. <laughs> okay, our final presenter, but then after that, I don't want you to run away because we have some fantastic resource booths and some treats and snacks out there. So I hope you linger around just a bit and I'll tell you about who all the different resource booths are as well. But we have uh, Katie, is Katie here? But Eric is, and do I understand? Do I understand like it was a day of teaching and parent teacher conferences and then you came here? Man, you guys are, you guys are all right. <laughs> okay, I give you this. Yeah, clicker for me. All right, five, excellent. Five, seven minutes or something. I, can, yeah, I don't have very many slides. Good evening, everybody. I, this is a great turnout, and actually, I'm um, I'm surprised actually to see I actually we actually have the smallest system of all three systems here, which is not usually the case when I talk about solar, which is wonderful. So um, we built a garage at the back of our property on 44th Street in 2009, and you can't tell from the angle here, but our property is only 50 feet wide and 200 feet deep. So we built a garage that was wide so we could turn into it. And we also have a 1908 house with a 12 and 12 roof at the top. And our contractor said, well, you should match the roof of your house with the garage for aesthetic purposes. It's an old house. And I said, you know, I can do the math. 12 and 12 roof, I'm thinking 28 foot wide garage. I'm like, that's gonna be an awfully big roof, isn't it? And he says, ah, you plant the tree. So, so we built the garage and indeed it is a very, very big roof. And we got done and all we saw was roof. We're sitting in the backyard, all we see was roof. Um, but it was a 45 degree angle. It does face due south. Um, you can talk to God from the top, which was not my primary concern. But um, I did start to think, because when we, when we had done an addition pre, a couple of years previous to this, I had thought about doing some kind of geothermal uh, installation. And I couldn't get any contractors really interested in it. And so I was somewhat disappointed um, that we weren't able to make some kind of alternative energy happen. So um, I actually uh, saw a contractor at the state fair and talked to them about uh, doing solar on a roof, and they came out and did an estimate for us. So that's um, Katie and me in the garage with our contractor, Rebecca Lundberg of uh, Powerfully Green, looking at the panels stacked in the garage. We have 30 silicon energy solar panels. These are the made in Minnesota panels that you can get a special rebate for. Um, each one's four by four. They ha each are rated to produce 190 watts. And the way these are made, it's some special technology. The solar wafers are embedded in two sheets of glass, and the glass is fused together. So there's been a lot of talk about snow. Um, when it snows in these panels, they're glass. They have no edge to them. There's no framing around them. So when it snows, the snow slides down the panels. Um, not, not right away. If it's a heavy, wet snow, the type of snow you might get this type of year, you can actually see it sliding periodically while it's snowing. And then if, it's a, if it, the weather's colder, uh, when it snows, you'll watch the next morning, you know, after that front passes through and the sun comes out the next day, you'll watch. And if you hit it right, you'll see just when the snow starts to crack, and um, the snow all of a sudden will start to cascade. It's really cool. Um, so you can watch the snow. So, so, you know, we didn't have much snow and we didn't have much cold last winter. So I don't know how it'll do this winter. We installed January 5th of last year, but the snow was sliding off pretty easily from our panels. And our contractors actually built a solar pergola with these panels because they let some light through. And so they built this pergola over their deck. And theirs is only at about a 30% angle. And they, they say their snow slides off also. Um, so they're, they're great panels, they're very well rated. Someone else talked about the requirements for the rating, the internet. One point, is it actually, the rating is 1.1 inch hail yep. at 60 miles per hour. We got one and a quarter at 58 miles per hour, but roughly in there. I'm being conservative. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, that's the way our garage looked after we put on the 30, the, the, the 30 panels. It's a 5.7 kilowatt system. Uh, on a good day in the winter, it'll generate 20, kilo, 20 kilowatt hours per day. 
um, up to 35 in the summer. Our average usage, we, we don't use air conditioning either, and we have an old house, so our usage actually goes up in the winter. I also have uh, still one teenage daughter at home with long hair. So uh, just think about that for a moment. We use a lot of kilowatt hours on that. So uh, we actually are highest in the, in, in the winter. Uh, we have kind of two peaks, high in the winter, not quite as high in the summer, and then, and then uh, spring and fall are lower production times for us. We've produced 6.2 megawatts since January 5th, and Powerfully Green were our contractors. We've been getting checks from Excel. Well, we've been getting credits from Excel since around April. Uh, Excel uh, accumulates the credits till they reach 25 bucks. And then after it hits 25 bucks, they'll send you a check. So we've gotten several checks from Excel, but our credit for October was about $8. So now I expect to start paying for electricity from now through about the middle, the middle of March. Um, and I think I might have had one more slide. No, maybe I didn't. Maybe I, Oh, the cost. There it is. Um, that's Rebecca's partner, Dan Williams, putting the panels on our roof in November last year while it was snowing. It was actually snowing while they were up on the roof. Uh, so our system, the total cost was 51480 These Minnesota-made panels are actually a little bit more expensive than other panels you might get quoted. Um, but with the extra rebate, the cost comes down a lot. So um, we had our solar rewards at 225 per watt. Um, 16,000 um, from the Minnesota made rebate. Now that gets paid out in five installments. So you don't get that back all at once. And I actually thought it was gonna be, we'd have to wait a year for our first check, but we actually got our first check within a couple of weeks after we installed the panel. So it's really more like a four year payout uh, for, 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 the, for, that, for that rebate. Um, and so the net cost was 6,786. And based on our production of about 6.2, we'll probably do about 6.4 or 6.5 megawatts for the year. Uh, winter energy is 10 cents a kilowatt, summer energy is 11 cents a kilowatt. So I figure we're making, you know, our savings is about uh, somewhere around uh, $6,750 a year. So I'm figuring nine to 10 years on a payback for this. Um, and just in terms of the cost, you know, um, the solar rewards rebate we assigned to our contractor. So we actually didn't shell that money. I don't think we shelled that money out in advance or they got, we didn't pay the contractor in advance and then they just took the rewards directly. So I didn't have to shell out the amount of the, that $13,000. Um, and then also I happened to have my own business. So, and we, we installed late in 2011. And so I was just able to adjust my taxes um, for the 30% credit. And so we didn't have to shell out that money either. So our out of pocket was something, our initial out of pocket was something around $21,000, $22,000. And then we got that first check on the Minnesota made panels. So that even though the cost of the system was over $50,000, we didn't actually write a check at any point in time for, for $50,000. And I would just say, you know, you've seen some really big systems here. I mean, Grandview, you know, good for you guys, you know, 20, what is it, 27 kilowatts uh, and Chuck's at, uh, you know, 8.7 and ours, 5.7 is a pretty large of the, of the systems our contractor put in last year. They did about a, a dozen or maybe uh, 18 systems last year. You know, 5.7 was up there as one of the bigger ones, and there's a big cost to that. But, you know, if you have a smaller patch of roof that faces south, you know, you can do a smaller system, too. The great thing about solar is once you put it in, you can, I, I, you can just walk away from it. I mean, if I get home before dark, I will go over to our inverter and check and look and see what, you know, what, what we've done that day. But we didn't pay for the extra. F the, I love the web interface. It's great um, being able to check. You know, but I'm one of those people who actually watches my computer install software. You ever sit there and watch the dots just to install software, right? Come on, I know you do that, right? You sit there, you're waiting for it. I would be watching the solar all day long and not getting anything done. So um, I, didn't, I don't have the charts, and it just works. And, just, it, and it works all the time. And if it's cloudy out, it's still working. It's not working very much. You know, on a, these really heavy cloudy days we've had, you know, we might only be making like 200 watts an hour but it's still going. It's like a little Energizer Bunny. It just goes, it goes all the time, no maintenance, I don't do anything to it. And, it and it, so you just you install it, and then you just kind of watch the checks roll in from Excel. And plus you're saving the planet at the same time. It's great. So I want you all to go for it. So folks, some quick things. Uh, housekeeping, bathrooms are down the hall. 
tons of drinks and treats right there on the table. And I'll tell you who's out there and who you're going to talk with. Doug Shoemaker from Minnesota Renewable Energy Society. Wave to us. There he is. He's right there in the back. Doug knows more about solar, or he'll forget more about solar than I'll ever know. Please go talk to Doug at MRES. We have Yvonne Pfeiffer. She's already out there talking to somebody. She's from Excel Energy. She'll probably set you up with some information about energy efficiency first, but she'll also know something about solar rewards. And I'd also encourage you, uh, Google Solar Rewards Minnesota, and you can kind of see what's the latest and greatest. And Dustin had some good thoughts on uh, it goes fast when it does kind of pop up in there. We also have Center for Energy and the Environment and Jocelyn and Stacy, where are you? They are somewhere. Oh, well, they're at their table. They will tell you about the home energy squads, another way of getting energy audits at your homes. I encourage you to talk to them. Uh, I'll be over at the Clean Energy Resource Team's booth, um, and I have to make a plug February 20th and 21st in St. Cloud. I mean, who doesn't want to be in St. Cloud February 20th and 21st? It's our statewide conference, five to 600 people, all interested in energy efficiency and renewable energies like you, all these exhibitors, tons of uh, forums. Please, please, please come unless there's a blizzard and then you can stay home. And finally, who am I forgetting? I said MRES. Yes, wait, you're on my thank you thing. Hold on a second. Aaron and Ross from City of Edina, thank you very much. Aaron's back there working magical lights and cameras and stuff. Ross is right here. And let's hear it again for the Edina Energy and Environment Commission. Guys and ladies, where are you again? Raise your hands. Bob and Paul. There's a whole bunch of you. Are you you're out there too, right? Bill, and there's people here from other groups that are also on Ryan from Clean Energy Resource Teams, thank you. So please, guys, hang around, talk. There's a whole bunch of these solar installers. They know a lot more about solar than I ever will. Please ask them some questions, talk to them. And uh, have a great and wonderful evening. Thank you. How, how is it, or who do I talk to? If, if Thank you, Ross. Thank you. you want to Thank you.